from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is Mary Lou Reeker, and I want to welcome you today on behalf of the Library of Congress's John W. Kluge Center and the Office of Scholarly Programs to a lecture by Oksana Marafiotti entitled Magical Realism in Russia, How Family Cults, Shamanism, and Christianity Shaped the Nation. And before I begin, the usual reminders to either mute or turn off your cell phones. Uh, and also, I want to invite you to sign up for our RSS feeds. And there's paper right up here and pen, and you can do that on your way out. And you may also pick up a brochure if you're interested. Um, Oksana Marafioti is a Black Mountain Fellow at the Kluge Center. Her fellowship is part of a partnership between the Center and the Black Mountain Institute for Creative Writers and Scholars at the University of Nevada. Oksana was selected to spend a semester at the Library of Congress, essentially as a writer in residence, to research and to write an autobiographical narrative cast as a work of fiction. Her goal? to explore the effects of devovere, or double faith, and its role in folk belief systems, particularly during Russia's Soviet era. Oksana Marafioti was born in Latvia into a gypsy Armenian family of legendary vaudeville performers. They immigrated to the US and Oksana was trained as a classical violinist. Now she also developed a deep interest in two other things, one of them being cinematography and the other being folklore. She earned a degree in film from the University of Nevada and she went on to work as a cinematographer. Now simultaneously she was also writing short stories and she has a publication entitled The Perpetual Engine of Hope short stories inspired by iconic Las Vegas photographs that was published by Stevens Press in 2010, and she was a contributor to the journal Fairy Tale Review, published by the University of Alabama. She began to gather material for her current project by interviewing friends and family members, and she found that frequently their recollections involved elements of mysticism and folk belief. She also realized that great Russian literature contains those two elements too. And today we will find out more about how she's putting that all together as she develops her own memoir. Please help me welcome today, Oksana Mara Fioti. Thank you, Mary Lou, and thanks to everyone for being here. Maybe we should get cozy and come closer to the microphone. <laughs> what do you think? Everyone's kind of in one little corner up there. No? Okay. Well, uh, first I would like to begin by thanking uh, the Black Mountain Institute, um, especially Carol Harder and Richard Wiley, and also the Kluge Center, Carolyn Brown and Mary Lou Reeker for giving me this opportunity um, to do the research at the Library of Congress. That's completely amazing. Um, well, Mary Lou kind of summed up what I was going to talk about, so maybe we should just all go to lunch. <laughs> no, okay. All right, so um, uh, as Mary Lou mentioned, when we think of Russia, especially during the Soviet Union era, um, we resolutely conjure up Joe McCarthy's version of a nation lacking in spiritual and religious practices and bound by the strict regime of communist ideals. Um, having been born and raised in the former Soviet Union, I too once thought that. Um, but as I began working on my memoir, American Gypsy, I discovered that my memories were incomplete. So I went to my family to kind of fill in the gaps 
and uh, expecting to get a clear picture of Soviet life in general, I was surprised at the wealth of old world lore contained in almost every account I gathered. Every family member and friend included some element of mysticism or folk belief in their recollection, and a different world was coming to life. And maybe this has something to do with the fact that I do come from a stage family. I couldn't help myself. I had to put some pictures up of them. That's my mommy right there on the, on the bottom right there. Um, and, you know, it's an eccentric family, so I kind of figured that they must be just really overly superstitious, read too many fairy tales. That, that's got to be it. And um, I found out that that's not the case as I began to do my research, that, that kind of a, a, the magic realism exists in Russian culture, and it's very, very important. It's very significant. And um, magic realism is universal as a genre. In literature, film, um, and art, uh, it is a genre in which magic is a natural facet of reality. It's barely questioned. Presented side by side, the real and the fantastic coexist in a straightforward, no-nonsense manner. German art critic Franz Roch describes magic realism as a calm admiration of the magic of being, a question of representing before our eyes in an intuitive way the fact, the interior figure of the exterior world. So in this way, it's slightly different from what you would consider fantasy art or literature. The magic is what is unseen, but felt by most of us, you know. So you, really, if you consider the emotions, the, the spectrum of emotions that human can experience, um, it, it cannot be really defined scientifically, I think, at this point. And it kind of falls into the realm of this magic realism. It's real, and yet we cannot find the, the, an actual physical root of it. Um, Russian literature is infused with magic realism. And here are some books, probably some of the famous ones. The one on the right is by Tolstoy. It's the uh, fairy tale by, about Ivan the Fool, which you're prob some of you might be familiar with. Um, in turn, it is sub subtle and openly fantastical. It is an organic component of the author's perception. Mysticism marks everything from characters plucked straight out of fables, playing all roles on the stage of latest social discord, to superstitions masquerading as political sat satire. And I need to mention that the genre of magic realism would not exist without folk belief, and that folk belief is born of mythology. Mythology, in turn, evolves from archaic religions and belief systems. And my current project, um, which I guess is kind of autobiographical, but I don't like to mention it on TV, um, is a novel that will study the effects of folk belief on the Russian culture. It will also attempt to define magic realism as a mindset while looking at it from a historical and a cultural perspective. In short, I will explore magic realism as reality. Today we will look at three belief systems that contributed the most to the perseverance of magical realism in Russia. Uh, those belief systems are family cults, sometimes called um, household cultism, shamanism, and Christianity. Dating to about 17,000 years BC, household cultism is so ingrained in every layer of Russian way of life that it is almost impossible to remove without unraveling the very fabric of the culture. The practice consists of worship of indwelling nature deities and the souls of the dead ancestors called household spirits. In terms of their place in the pantheon of the early Russian theology, household and indwelling spirits, unlike celestial deities, reside on earth alongside people. And uh, these are some examples of, of the household deities and uh, indwelling spirits, mermaids. Most of you are probably familiar with, with the mermaids. The gentleman on the, on, in the center with the, the horns would be the leshe, which is um, the spirit of the forest. Um, there are other spirits of the forest, the werewolves, which are actually spirits in, in Russian folklore, and so on. Um, maintained usually by female family members who communicated with the spirits linked directly to that particular household or family tree, household cultism never shaped into an organized religion. 
So you would not find temples erected to practice it. Um, in some cases, there were unmarked sacred places where you could leave an offering, but you can give an offering in your house without ever leaving your kitchen. Makes it much easier that way, right? No texts of instruction were written. No special education or a higher sense of calling or a special robe was required to practice. No clerics, therefore no clerical hierarchy. This lack of unity within the practice is one of the main reasons that family cultism has actually survived in, in altered forms. Um, maybe not even consciously practiced, but it definitely exists in Russian society to this day. Um, it would not fare so well had it required temples or priests. As it was, household cultism was barely acknowledged by theological and political leaders set out to reshape the country in order to fit their agendas. Out of sight, out of mind would really apply here. So this guy, Damavoy, is one of the most well-known Russian household spirits. I don't know if there are any Russians in the, in the room. No? OK. Well, if, if there was one Russian, they would know. You, have you ever heard of Damavoy? OK. Konechno, there you go, which means, of course. So Damavoy was usually the ancestor spirit. It started off as a grandfather, but over the centuries, it's just a male ancestor. And like all the other family cult deities, the Mavoy is benign unless provoked. There are no good or bad gods in family cultism. Rather, the metaphysical world of family cults and the human world are symbiotic, and the notion of good and evil is yoked solely to human actions and not to the character or the whimsy of gods. Now, this is not the case um, when it comes to shamanism the next belief system in our trio, tells quite a different story. Strict division of universal forces into two camps. Um, there is good and evil. And that is what distinguishes shamanism from family cultism in Russia. But even more notably, one thing family cults can never provide is the promise of happy afterlife. Shamans with their metaphysical lines open all the way to heavens know exactly the rights to assure one's place in paradise. Sounds familiar, right? Finnish shamanism inspired Russian shamanism most directly, although Central, shaman, Central Asian shamanism definitely is, is more significant to most cultures in that area. First traces of practice in the Siberian regions date to approximately 10,000 BC. Shamanism is very much about the ritual, the visual of the ceremony requiring meticulous preparation and often an altered state of mind. So shaman priests would often take something in order to connect with the spirit. The objects used are considered mystical and sacred. Um, an indwelling spirit of a family cult would do just fine with an offering of an apple. Family cults have a direct relationship with the spirits where shaman priests are needed to interpret message, messages between people and gods. While family cults are concerned with the immediate world, shamanism appeals to the spiritual one reaching to the stars, begging mercy of gods, rarely benevolent. The family members who maintain family cults are a part of the society. The shamans are different by virtue of their unique talents. And you can see in this illustration, it's called Priests of the Devil. It's the first uh, depiction of a shaman in Siberia. And I think it was made by a Dutch traveler. And he, he gave him clawed feet and uh, antlers. And obviously, the name speaks for itself, the devil. So definitely, a shaman priest was not considered human. Nowhere else is the difference between these two practices more evident than in the Russian folk song and storytelling, oral traditions alive even today. The stories of indwelling and protective household spirits striving to care for the families to which they owe allegiance are easily distinguished from the songs of celestial deities who control human fates. Why, though, does shamanism hold so much sway over early Russian society? Three factors, fear, power, and our inherent desire, inherent desire for the spectacle. In addition, the rise in popularity of shamanism might have its roots in the, the generation of a predominantly matriarchal society. At first, shamanism is performed by, performed by women. They are concerned with the afterlife, wandering souls, and illness. But not just that, they are master manipulators in possession of the sacred knowledge necessary to appease the gods. In short, they're very influential. 
As communities grow and wealth accumulates, rifts between social statuses create the need to control population. Slowly the power is shifted from priestess to priests, and women are wrestled out of religion leadership completely. The practice of shamanism over centuries reinforces the growing distance between people and the world around them, and the path is laid out for the next religion on our list, which is Christianity. When Christianity enters the picture around 988 AD, the entire country is converted by a single ceremony of King Vladimir's baptism. The decision is purely political as Vladimir is striving for a more unified state to fend off Nordic kings. And majority of the population will for centuries be oblivious to the fact that they are officially Christian. As Russia's first organized religion spreads, a new term is coined by its clerics. Yazichistva, and um, it could also be called Slavic paganism, um, is loosely translated into speaking in tongues. Yazichistva groups all preceding belief systems of the territory into one, regardless of their vast differences in practice and purpose. In this way, family cultism and shamanism join ranks with toteism, idol worship, season worship, and many forms of polythetic worship. Yazichistva's collective theology begins to transform into Christian demonology, so the old gods are not forgotten. They're just given new roles. And in its new plays, with names of gods and spirits barely altered, Yazichistva is just as popular as ever, and a new spiritual and religious culture is born. Caught between the old gods and the new, the population is faced with a dilemma. Which gods should they really worship? Old question, right? Um, and they decide better not to provoke either side, and they proceed to give pagan offerings while, while worshiping in churches. That said, Christianity is still followed super, superficially at best. During the 10th and 12th centuries, the peasant classes of Russian society conserve the old and more traditional ways of life. A largely agrarian society, Russia still seeks the protection of family cults and the familiarity of shamanic mysticism. And unlike ever before, the two ideologies develop ties in order to keep safe from the growing authority of Christian orthodoxy. In this new Russia, between the pages of orthodox religious manuscripts, the shaman priest of the past and the family members whispering offerings to their household spirits are given new titles, demoted to new roles, those of sorcerers and witches. In fact, the list of practitioners of Yuzichistva is divided into so many categories according to the type of magic, and it is called magic now practiced, that most Christian priests need a book to tell them apart. And some of these are right there on that screen if you wanted to read through them while I get a drink of water. It's amazing because essentially all of these people were just priests you know, within their old belief systems, and now they're given these really strange names like Warlock and uh, Black, Black Book Magicker, Shadow Seeker, Mutterer. I mean, how do you get that title, really? Charmer, you know. Um, so the last one, Volkovi, which are the priest mystics. If we could just look at those for a second. Volkovi are considered especially dangerous. In Russian language, even to this day, Volk means wolf. So they're especially dangerous. By the time Russia is baptized as Christian, this group of priest mystics who practice a hybrid of shamanism and family cultism has long gained considerable authority over the masses. Russian historian Russell Zhguda writes that the Volkovi were a distinct urban and upper class phenomenon. So not some small village practitioners. They dealt with, directly with the leaders of the communities and now they're being pushed out. Since at first Christianity is the religion of the royals in Russia and of those in the upper strata of Russian society, it's not surprising that Volkovi fight back. The church and the state spent most of the 11th century suppressing one rebellion after another. But eventually Volkovi lose their official rank becoming nothing more than practitioners of magic. In case of shamanism, since the belief system is grounded into trusting your faith to a higher being, a superior God, 
The conversion into the Christian church is almost inevitable. Many become monks, teaching the Gospels and animistic spiritualism, which is now infused with the mythology of family cults. And these mystics don't think of the shift as a betrayal of their old faith. Um, they find it more of a slight adjustment to accommodate this new faith coming in. So basically they're saying, you know, we're strong, we know our religion, these new guys are coming in and they just need a place to belong. We'll just take them in for a little bit, show them how kind we are. Thus the Russian school of mysticism is born. It might seem that overall Christianity meets with very little outward resistance, but centuries later, devout Christians are still leaving offerings by oak trees and on lake shores, still uttering pagan prayers, still writing incantations on apples and pieces of wood and placing them on altars during mass. In fact, the habit of leaving objects on altars near and near icons continues well into the 19th century. During the period roughly between 12th and 15th centuries, the relationship between Yazidniki and Christians is for the most part cordial. In royal palaces, sorcerers and Orthodox priests stand side by side, serving the Tsar in equal measure, even if through different, different means. And um, some of these signs you, you can see in the, in, in the art and architecture and culture, just the fusions of two. For example, this is the, the Church of St. Saint, Saint George, and it was built near a fortress. So the fortress was never destroyed. It was kind of built close to it, and the fortress wraps around it. You can't see all of it, but it's really, really nice. And these are some other examples, just some of the signage uh, top left. You have the cross and then you have the pagan sign, the thunder sign kind of hanging off the roof. Um, bottom left um, is a cross and it also, it's kind of juxtaposed against a pagan a thunder sign, which was the equivalent of the cross really. And it's called, it's called the Pristolnik Krest, which means that, you know, if you, wanted to just sit down by the church, have a drink, say a prayer. That's what that cross would be for. And it accommodates more than one religion. And the one on the top right was a uh, first chapel built in the city of Bilazersk. And it was actually uh, planned, you know, the building of it was planned by both the Christians and the, the, the Yazidist groups in that city. And that's why it's surrounded by trees, which some of you might know, you know, most pagan structures are circular, surrounded by either stone walls or, or nature. Um, so throughout Russian history, Christian church is closely tied to the monarchy and to the politics of the yet forming nation. But in the first few centuries after King Vladimir's conversion, most Yazidniki are carving out a corner for what they view as a young religion looking for a place to belong. Quite unaware that they are slowly losing most of their indigenous faiths to a force that will soon attempt to eradicate any traces of old Yazidistva from the spiritual and the cultural landscape. Between the 10th and 16th century, one monarch after another endeavors to keep uh, Russia unified and strong. But Russian history is marked with political turmoil, much of it having to do with a struggle between the faiths, monarchy, and the church. And it seems even the organized religion at this time fails to stay organized for long. Reminiscent of Russia's pre-Christian past, numerous religious, Christian religious sects emerge. And this is another list. Really, really amazing um, how they, I mean, there were many more than this. I couldn't really fit them on one screen, but this is just an example. Unlike their Yazidniki predecessors, these sects are addressed collectively as nonconformists. Russian philosopher Sergei Bolshikov writes this on the subject. In Russian history, nonconformity nearly always stood on the side of democratic ideals and in favor of a free church in a free state. In a sense, nonconformity may be thought of as a natural expression, expression of Slavonic elements in Russian life. Although it is foolish and profitless to generalize about nations and races, it could be said nevertheless that the Slavs have been democratic and freedom-loving people inclined to factions and anarchy. Perhaps because of this Slavonic propensity, none of the Slavic peoples have been able to create a great, strong, and lasting empire, except for the Moscovites. Anarchy. Do you think so? By the 16th century, Russian Orthodox Church is well established, 
and Yazichistva is no longer welcome anywhere near the ruling class. What once was the fate of the land is now labeled as dangerous and heathen, the stuff of fairy tales. Blind superstition takes root in the hearts and minds of the Russian aristocracy, eventually bleeding down to the various social classes. Dubbed superstitious folk belief by the clergy, Yazichistva is hardly mentioned in the chronicles kept by the monks. Old rites are remembered only in towns and villages most removed from the big cities. While family cultism and shamanism are still alive, they give up their place on the, on the throne for good. Practicing magic or anything that could be branded as magic is against the law and punishable by death. Nobles hide their children behind walls in fear they would be cursed by witches. Burnings at stake become a regular occurrence, most sanctioned by the rich claiming to be wronged. Sorceries to blame for nearly every royal death. This is the case in the death of Ivan III's wife, Maria, in 1467, and Ivan the Terrible's first wife, whom you can see in this um, picture. Um, she was the first wife of eight. She was his favorite. She was also the first Russian Tsaritsa. Her name was Anastasia Romanova, and she died in 1560. And some claim that, that that was the moment of his, the beginning of his downward spiral, because he really was co convinced that she was killed by a sorcery. And he, in turn, killed a bunch of people for it. In 1653, Tsar Alexei issues a decree ordering all items perceived useful in magic ceremonies to be destroyed. These included, they include but are not limited to books, grasses, and potions. That same year, 1653, Patriarch Nikon of the Russian Church attempts to bring unity between religious rites of Russian and Greek Orthodoxy. This revamping is also meant to reintroduce purity into the debauched Russian society, to heal the populace clearly bewitched. Triggered by Nikon's editing, the church splits between the official new church and the movement of old believers who refused to give up their rights to practice the way they practiced for centuries at this point. And these old believers join the ranks with the other nonconformists. Therefore, they become criminals, though they would never admit it, of course. And this movement comes to be known as Raskol, which means the splitting. And many people died. That's all I have to say on the subject. Um, Nikon's ambitious perestroika creates only more chaos among the already unstable social order. And yeah, not only, as you can see, the burnings and the general violence ensues, but also it inspires a mass suicide by nearly 30,000 old believers who regard Raskol as a sign of Armageddon. But alas, the split does very little to make the royals behave. Um, let's take Peter the Great, for example. There is an old anecdote about Peter riding around the country, personally cutting the beards off the, the men who refused to join um, the, the modern society. And he grants them titles of counts and barons without explaining how counts and barons should act. It is well accepted that Peter nearly single-handedly civilized the Russian peasant by bringing Western European culture to their doorstep. But during Peter's reign, it's also often whispered that the Tsar having received poor education and never demonstrating an eager fondness for the church, has himself remained a heathen and a peasant, and that no amount of colorful silk and careful, carefully executed French could hide his unrefined Russian soul. As if to confirm this last bit of gossip, two things in particular stand out. First, documented evidence confirming that Peter's family line, before his rule and after, is involved in various legal dealings of mystical nature. For example, the battle for the throne between Peter and his half-sister Sophia is rife with allegations of sorcery. And a second indication um, involves his own son and heir to the throne, Alexei Petrovich. In 1718, Alexei is brought upon charges of using black magic to try and overthrow his father. Whether presented for political reasons or out of pure superstition, the accusation holds water with a grand council of 126 members. Alexei is found guilty and sentenced to death. And uh, the document of the proceedings, the trial proceeding can, proceeding can actually be found at the Library of Congress. So if you're curious, you can read about it. Now, 
Though Peter continuously clashes with the heads of the church over his aim to westernize Russia, he does not shun his faith. But even here, he finds ways to rebel. When he commissions a church in 1714 in celebration of his victories over the Swedes, it is built not from whitewashed stone, which is a material more suitable for a place of worship at that time in Russia, but from pine and aspen wood. According to Slavic tradition, aspen is a tree of great importance, said to have protective properties against supernatural forces. It also hardly rots. The Church of Transfiguration is breathtaking. Its impressive cupola is covered with close to 40,000 aspen shingles. You can see that on the right. Not a single nail is used in its construction. That is absolutely amazing. And there are actually two other churches behind it. You can't really see. You can see one kind of to the left of it. And the clerics voice their complaint, dubbing the church primitive at best. In their opinion, the design is clearly suggestive of the heathen churches of the early Russian Christianity, a period in time when pagan influences still hold sway over religious minds. It is 18th century, and as Russia enters the international arena of politics and commerce, foreigners flock to her, and some of the most comprehensive descriptions of the country and its past are penned not by the native chronicles, who show little interest in their own history, but by travelers from abroad. It is an exciting time for Russian royalty, nobility, and the merchant class, but the craftsmen, and especially the peasantry, are living a different reality altogether. Serfdom, which has existed in Russia since the 11th century, is still in place, and by 1859, over 40% of the population is bonded to their landowner. When serfdom is abolished in 1861, freed peasants, deprived of rights and education for so long, are the same viewpoint as they were in the 17th century. The cultural movements of Renaissance and Enlightenment never quite reach them, and despite the wealth of the country's upper class, economic backwardness is a term frequently used in the foreign text describing Russia of this period. Living off the land as serfs first and now as poor farmers, peasants still nurture their connection with the pre-Christian religions that have never betrayed them. In rural Russia, Russian homes, you'll find talismans and spells displayed alongside the icons of Christian saints. And it's even true today. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. By mid-1800s, most rural folk have heard of God, but don't know much about Jesus, even while they attend the village church. And this might have something to do with the fact that the clergy itself is only vaguely familiar with what they're supposed to be teaching. So they kind of combine things and improvise. Um, books of Psalms and the Bible are freely used for bibliomancy, which is the practice of using randomly selected passages to predict the future. In fact, Bible is the best book to use for that, just in case you're curious. According to, to them, <laughs> in general, peasants have little respect for the clergy who have so far demonstrated an inclination to support the monarchy and the ruling class. Having seen little more than hardship affected by none other than their own countrymen, the Russian peasant is at best skeptical of organized religion and the state, if not downright disillusioned. The peasant class begins to stand apart in unity, questioning policies they lacked the voice to question before. They show a sense of duty, loyalty, and devotion to their immediate communities, honest in their dealings with one another and always watchful of outsiders. The rift between the peasant and the aristocrat is never more devastatingly palpable than now. It seems the only champions of the underprivileged are artists, many of whom come from aristocracy and are prominent intellectuals of their time. They, seem, they esteem peasantry as the anchor of Russian culture and the source of Russian, Russian moral strength. Most great Russian writers, Pushkin, Gogol, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, scarcely mask their openness to the mystical world of their ancestors. Their spiritual identity is so inbred into their psyche that the influences can be without much difficulty picked out of their texts. Even westernized, their familiarity and ease with what has now become known as folklore and superstition drive them in their search to define the Russian spirit. In a country actively seeking to join the Industrial Revolution 
to the West, these writers are becoming the leading force behind the movements to promote spiritual belief and national identity over materialism. Folklore and folk belief have been mainly preserved in, an, in the oral tradition. For centuries, centuries, literate clerics and scribes refused to write down the songs, the stories, the philosophies, labeling them pagan in origin. By 19th century, folklore is all but aban abandoned by the educated classes, reduced to the role of primitive fairy tales made up to amuse the simple folk. It's not until Russian writers, artists, and composers turn their attention to the study of Russian spirit that folklore truly gains popularity. In turn, new interest is ignited among the Russian historians, who for the first time ever turn their attention to folklore as means to understanding the people. During the period between 1860s to about 1930s, an extensive body of work on early Russian history, folklore, mythology, and mysticism is produced. By 1900s, Russian agricultural class amounts to 82%. And as the majority of the production industries are undermanaged, Russia's shaky economy is heading for disaster. And it doesn't help that Tsar Nikolai II is more concerned with safeguarding autocracy than with the fact that immediate reform is needed to prevent the country from collapse. The royal family's close relationship with a healer by the name of Grigory Rasputin, of course I had to talk about Rasputin. I kept pushing him out of the text and he just kept moving back in. Well, the relationship only inflames general population's irritation with monarchy. Rasputin is right there on the left, between, sitting between the two women. Uh, the woman in the black hat is his wife, and the girl next to them with kind of the navy looking uh, collar is his daughter, Matriona, who actually ran away to the United States after his death and became a lion tamer in uh, Barnum and Bailey Circus. <laughs> She, has a really, she had a really amazing life. She was married to many great men, and <laughs> that's important, right? And uh, she actually wrote a book about it, too, about her life with her father and everything. So if you're interested in Rasputin, I would, I would give her book a try. Um, the gathering forces of the new working class target Rasputin as the architect behind the Tsar's every move, and they blame the magic man for the monarch's inadequacies. It is most curious that the new leadership and training, so these are the people who are going to become Bolsheviks and, and communists, right? Um, the, the, the men and the women who are well-versed in Marx and Engels and who proclaim to be socialist and secular, they use as their strongest argument against Nikola, Nikolai his susceptibility to magic. They are absolutely convinced Rasputin has bespelled the royal family Feared for his sorcery, Rasputin is hunted down and killed. Reports of his death warrant an entry of their own in some book of supernatural lore. According to these, first he's poisoned, but the poison that should have killed him immediately doesn't take, so he's still walking around. Then he's shot quite a few times, but not before one of the men runs off because he thinks Rasputin is immortal. Um, bullets don't kill him either, though. So lastly, suggestive of the old witch trials, a rock is hung from his neck and he's drowned. And to prove that he's dead, they actually fished him out of the river and took many pictures, which you can find if you Google it. Um, three months later, Tsar Nikolai II is stripped of his crown and the temporary provisional government takes charge. One of the first things they do is order Rasputin's body to be excavated, excavated, and burned in a public square. It is said that Rasputin set up in his coffin while burning and waved at the mob. <laughs> Chaos ensued and quite a few people were injured in the process. Of course, we all know, right, that you have to cut the tendons just, just so, so that the body doesn't look like it's moving when it's being cremated, right? We all knew that, okay. Yeah. Well, now you do. Um, the revolution of 1917 is inevitable at this point. The gap between the workers and the, the despised gentry class Having become so revolting, it mocks the masses, goads them into following anyone who could bring the elite to justice. And they find their defender in the man by the name 
of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. God, I used to worship the guy in school. <laughs> crazy, crazy stuff. Um, the Bolshevik Revolution is savage and merciless. The royal family is slaughtered along with thousands of royalists who failed to escape the country. Socioeconomically, it can be said that Russia leaps from middle age straight into the age of communism. The people are ready for change and leave they do, blindly seeking the promise of a utopian society. Now this is where it really gets good. And Lenin insists that the first step to achieving this is systematic eradication of organized religion, which he views as the machine of the bourgeoisie class to dominate the poor. Orthodox churches and monasteries are looted and leveled, monks, nuns, and clerics murdered. Likewise, everything accomplished during the golden age of traditional folklore revival is all but erased from the popular culture, almost single-handedly, by Lenin's wife, Nadezhda Krupskaya, who becomes the head of the education department. Anything even hinting of spiritualism, even fairy tales, is taken out of school curriculum. Concurrently, something strange begins to happen. In the eyes of many, Lenin becomes God. To be deified was never his intention, and Lenin is worried. He also questions if communism can truly be implemented, or if it's, the, if it's an idea best left to theory. But of course, the juggernaut that is the Russian Communist Party is on the move, and he's too late to do anything about it. Before his death, Lenin warns his closest followers against attempting to create a new religion. Wasn't the Red, Party most important mission, Red Party's most important mission to banish God from Russia? Lenin dies in 1924, and Stalin takes his place. The deceased leader is immediately embalmed, against his wishes, I'm sure, and laid out on display in a mausoleum built in the shape of a pyramid, especially for this purpose. Now, obviously, pyramids have always been attributed mystical qualities. So how does this fit into the Bolshevik um, ideals? Well, according to Stalin, brilliantly, um, he heedless of Lenin's counsel, is ready to deliver Russia into the age of cosmic enlightenment. With proper metaphysical groundwork and scientific execution, this student of the occult plans to achieve ultimate power, one that transcends death and the need for a physical body altogether. In short, the power of immortality of the mind. And who but Lenin himself should be the first man revived? Famous Soviet writer Maxim Gorky, who is the active, he's an active supporter and participant in Stalin's project, writes this. Personally, I prefer to imagine man as a machine which transmutes in itself so-called de dead matter into a psychical energy and will. In some way, in some faraway future, transform the whole world into a purely psychical one. Everything will disappear, being transmuted into pure thought which alone will exist, incarnating the entire mind of humanity. Which always reminds me of Johann Krauss from Hellboy. No one familiar with Hellboy? Okay, one person. So it's a comic book character, and the comic book is Hellboy. And um, it is essentially a spirit, right, that animates a machine. So every time I read these, these these passages from Gorky's writing and Stalin's ideas always brings me to this. This is essentially what they would want us to look like in the future. Stalin's followers call themselves fantasists and God builders. God building is a cultic philosophy arguing that humans can turn into gods by defeating death. Behind Kremlin's closed doors, the God builders are hashing out plans for a society in which a symbiotic link between human mind and technology would exist. As a sentient machines, humans would conquer space and time itself. And of course, this kind of sounds like H.G. Wells' novel, right? And it probably should, because Wells made several trips to Russia to visit his old friend, Maxim Gorky, who later arranged meetings with Lenin and Stalin, which I think is really crazy. <laughs> but they really believed in, in the Wells, Wells' idea of the future. It is Gorky who convinced Stalin that folklore is the perfect vehicle for their vision because it's always maintained an overwhelming influence over the people. Knowing how difficult it would be to eradicate the old belief systems 
and religion from the minds of Soviet Russians, the state takes control of folklore and changes it to serve social and communist purpose. New slogans, such as, we were born to make fairy tales come true, are tooted from placards, and a new party-friendly folk genre of folk folkloristica is created. Stalin opens uh, state-run centers where folk artists of all mediums are trained to learn the facts and ideologies. This is also where fairy tales are rewritten to serve a single purpose, essentially to brainwash the masses. As a direct result of folkloristica, Stalin becomes a demigod himself, residing in a thrice tenth kingdom of Kremlin. During World War II, fighter pilots whisper Stalin's name before flying into battle, convinced it carries magical powers to protect them from harm. It is said he possesses the gift of thought transference and can control the masses in this way. He reads minds, of course, and he is an incarnation of an ancient god on top of that. Um, but those closest to him are actually afraid of him. His own daughter, Svetlana, says that a terrible demon has possession of my father. One of his generals claims he's not a man, but a devil. And Stalin's brother-in-law writes, I started to understand how Stalin managed to make himself a god. He did not have a single human characteristic. Even when he exhibited some emotions, they did not seem to be real. Notice how none of them just say that he was crazy. You know, he's possessed, he's a demon. Folklore becomes the most important component of socialist realism, which is the official art form of Soviet Russia. Soviet folklorists claim that in conditions of the socialist reality, the folklore assumes new forms and becomes new both in quality and content. So this means that they can change it at will because it's new, even though it's folklore. In this new Russia, there are two realities, ordinary and extraordinary, and two groups of human beings, ordinary humans, foreigners, and superhumans, Russians. And socialist realism is used to represent the might of a Soviet superhuman society in most astonishing and supernatural, if needed, ways. Now, here you see some of the posters from that time. If you look at the one on top, it says, I see the glory of the past in the feet of my grandkids. And the man who says that is, is a bagatir, which is a character straight out of Russian mythology and fairy tales. Um, and I think originally when, when he was introduced into the fairy tale, it was as a protector of Christianity. So it's kind of ironic that it's used for a communist purpose here. Um, the one on the left says, glory to the heroes of the patriotic war, glory to Stalin's falcons. A falcon is a very prominent character in Russian fairy tales, and those are the, the fighter pilots who would you know, say his name before going up into the air. And on the right, Stalin is the greatness of our time. Stalin is the symbol of our victories. Um, Stalin is often depicted floating above the masses in the sky. Um, the new genre of magic realism is now fully formed. Actually, I have one more. This is really interesting. Um, this is kind of the beginnings of the communist magical realism genre um, as a literary genre. This, this is a serialized book by Marietta Shaganyan, who was writing under the pseudonym of Jim Dollar. She was st Stalin, one of the favorite uh, authors, Stalin's favorite author. And um, this book, Mess Mend, which actually means deconstruct, reconstruct. So she's using English words here. And it was all about how the American industrials, in, industrialists are fighting with the, the Soviet you know, working class. And the Americans are using black magic and the Soviets are using white magic. So it's all you know, not grounded in reality at all, obviously. Um, and I guess it was really, really popular because there's quite a few of them that kept coming out one after another. Um, let's see. And the genre, okay, the genre of magical realism is now fully formed, rooted in the two things. One, the folkloric traditions, which evolved directly from family cultism, and two, Soviet's exploitation of fairy tale to serve their agenda. The fantasy of magic realism is not limited to literature and the arts. In Russian reality, occult and politics converge to create a culture of fear and superstition 
and shape an entire nation's collective subconscious for the next 60 years. No other era or administration adopts mysticism to serve it in such a direct way. At least not since, I don't know, the Egyptians, maybe? Um, granted, it is a state-controlled and manufactured kind of mysticism, but nevertheless, this modified brand of mysticism does provide the basis for Soviet government's seemingly bewitching power over its people. With the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, pandemonium is unleashed. Every level of Russian society is affected, and the new government struggles to gain some semblance of control. During unrest that lasts for at least a decade, if not more, the masses begin to flock to churches, old and new, seeking reason and guidance in the only places that withstood a history plagued with uncertainty. Even the nation's first official president, Boris Yeltsin, is not immune. He employs a team of Kremlin staff astrologers to guide him during this time. And so does Vladimir Putin today, just so you know. Not to say that these men are blindly ruled by superstition, but the fact that they do place some value in the metaphysical arts is undeniable. In today's Russia, there is a marked resurgence of various Yazichistu and religious practices, everywhere from rural towns to large cities. Russian history, and especially prehistory, are closely studied by local scholars. And at least for now, no one tries to deny the existence of the elusive Russian spirit, which fascinated the great Russian artists. As before, the old and the new, reality and fantasy, tip their hats to one another, having never quite managed to walk their separate paths. And this is the last slide. I don't know where it comes from, but that is a pagan monument that has been turned into a playground. And I am done. Thank you very much. All right, no questions? Let's go to lunch. Well, we've got about six, seven minutes for questions. OK. I knew you were going to ask me a question. <laughs> Thank you. Most famous ones, yeah. Mm Yeah. Phenomenal stuff in Germany, really, right? And then, of course, Malevich, who, who builds the supermodernism, he also, the first decade of, of the Soviet history is full of the space and geographies without the going into the right? And yeah, in the artistic stuff. circles, yeah. And Between a peace which is serving a sort of 
It is very interesting. I think partially the problem is that um, the Russians themselves, you know, the historians, the folklorists, or whoever is in, in charge of a specific area, don't study them well enough because they don't give it any importance. You know, that, that kind of a link that's always been there between the peasantry and the creative force of, of you know, the region, not just Russia, but the entire region of what used to be the Soviet Union. It never died, it was always there, and even though Stalin was using it as propaganda, there were all these underground movements that were alive on their own. You're right. Well, yes, um, I was comparing it to family cultism that came before that had to do with, with living in, you know, in harmony with the world itself, the immediate world. So not really looking so much into heavens or the, the, uh, the afterlife, but to what, how you're doing now in, in the moment. And with shamanism, the introduction of, of the, the ethereal gods created this rift where people couldn't really worship on their own. They needed a certain, um, a certain way of doing it. You know, They needed a Prius to be the medium between them and the world that could promise to them you know, a happy life and a happy afterlife. So that's, that's what I was talking about. Did the in-house um, spirits or gods come even if you didn't give them an offering? And, and did the shaman sort of self-identify themselves as that power, or did the community have to select a shaman who would have that power? I think originally, from what I'm reading, shamans are identified as, as someone, like a special child, who's groomed to become a shaman. Um, and as I said before, I think it, it was really politically dri driven. So whoever was chosen was usually from a very good family within the community um, and given that rank because next to the leader of the community, the shaman was the, the second in command, really. And uh, to answer your first question with the indwelling spirits, the indwelling spirits were indwelling, so they, they did not come and go. They were just part of nature. So lake spirits, forest spirits, river spirits. And same thing with household spirits. And the only reason people would give offerings is just to make them, you know, uh, to be friendly with them and to make sure that, you know, their crops would grow properly or something like that. So it wasn't, it wasn't to invite them in. It was just kind of to make that, that relationship going in the right direction. Unless there is no question. Oh, good. I, I would love to hear your comment more on the technomysticism that um, tries to get away from nature, um, from um, the embodied nature of living. Um, I was reminded of Dostoevsky's demons, mm -hmm. uh, where his character is think, always thinking about committing suicide, uh, has precisely those thoughts. Um, is that, can that be found elsewhere in Russian? culture or is it more of a, um, a modern? You mean mysticism as in getting away from reality and going right. into mystical? I think it's a very common thread in the Russian um, literature and the art itself. There's always that, that sense that there's something else of, you know, um, other than you and it might be better. And I think it, it does have to do with the fact that the culture, the peasantry was just, you know, the agrarian society that people were living in was just just marked with so much, uh, you know, hatred and hardship, is that they were looking for some someplace else, um, you know, hoping that they could that would be a better place to go to at some point. The denial of, of the it is, and it kind of falls into the whole, you know, that's why Stalin succeeded so well because it was the denial of the corporeal. We don't need the body, you know, we have our mind and we're powerful in that sense. And there was no question of a soul. It was all in the mind. Thank you That's it. so Thank much. You. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.